Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of Podcast Pasta. That's a podcast that's like pasta, not the podcast that's about pasta. As always, I'm your host, Mike, and today I want to talk about the What If series. I recently caught up with season two. Uh, for those of you who don't know or don't necessarily keep up, keep up with the you know What If series, Marvel animated show. So far, it's only had two seasons. The first season, I think, came out in like, 2020 it, it's been a while since i've seen it but um came out in 2020 uh was nominated for an emmy i think it lost to like arcane or something like that um and recently this uh past like holiday season we got season two release but it had like a daily episode release as opposed to like the weekly uh episode release that you see with the most marvel shows um and I, the reason that I probably did that was to maintain like Disney Plus subscribership, you know, during the holiday season because that's when you know people are more likely to have time to watch like you know streaming shows. So you, you have something big like that, it'll have people like you know get on to subscribe or at least to try it and then hopefully subscribe. So what have you? Um, but I yeah I I recently caught up with season two. And this show is um, interesting to me because both season one and season two had the, the kind of the same problem for me. Now, not to say that I, I dislike the show at all. I, I I do enjoy it for what it is. Although I, I, I will get to this kind of later, but I think it, while I do think it could have been better, I think for what they have been given us, it's uh, it, it has some good aspects to it, but it's i mean but i'll I'll go into that more as i uh continue on so season two a lot like season one has this issue where a lot of the initial episodes range from pretty like okay like decent to just bad right um, but as you go on with the series, you get to, you hit like one really good, like really solid episode. And then from there, the series, the, the season is just super interesting, right? So just to give you for context, I'll go and just like, um, give you a quick rundown of each episode. So you kind of see what I'm talking about. So season two opens with what if Nebula joined the Nova Corps? And this one I thought was all right. I like Nebula as a character, so it was cool to see like this episode follow her perspective um, and kind of follow her as like this like noir cop working under the Nova Corps. It's kind of dragged down, and you'll see this as like a pattern in some of the future episodes. But this one's kind of dragged down by like the modern Marvel quippy writing that I know like myself and a lot of other people have just grown exhausted with. Uh, but here it's not too bad because those characters aren't like the focus, you know, you have a, I, I think the worst example is Korg, like the rock dude. Oh, uh, he's so bad in this series and this isn't even his like worst episode, but um, yeah, he's pretty, he's pretty bad here. I'm not going to lie. Um, but it's kept to a minimum because he's like a side character. Uh, so overall, first episode was like, okay, right? Uh, you go into season two, or not season two, episode two, what if Peter Quill attacked Earth's Mightiest Heroes? Again, kind of an okay one. I think in some ways a little better than the first episode. It plays around with like this cool idea of kind of following an older, like, not older in terms of age, but like an Avengers team, but before the Avengers team that we have. So you have like Hank Pym, you have T'Challa's dad, I believe, as like Black Panther, uh, Lawrence Fishburne's character, uh, Peggy Carter is there, um, Nick Fury, you know, basically the leader of them all. And overall pretty fun, like pretty fun episode, I think. Not like super amazing, but it's kind of like, an interesting concept like what if an interdimensional like entity or something or not interdimensional because i don't know if peter quill would qualify as that but um you know what if this like giant threat attacked earth but before like the modern avengers right so they had to assemble like you know an earlier avengers team so pretty fun concept but nothing really too amazing i think 
Uh, moving into episode three, what if Happy Hogan saved Christmas? Hated it. Basically, Marvel Die Hard. It's such a weird episode. Uh, it follows like Happy Hogan. It's dragged down by... <sighs> And I feel so bad for doing this because, like, Kate, Kate Dennings, um, I can't remember the name of her character in the MCU, but she, like, is a part of this episode, and she's, like, you know, again, has the issue with, like, the modern, quippy Marvel writing, right? Um, and any time that Kate Dennings' character is in any of these series, from, like, the movies to, like, the TV shows, I have just... I, I just I just hate her so much it's 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 not her herself like I'm sure like she has been in good works before it's just again like having her as like the side character with this like quippy writing it's just it just drags it all down for me personally like none of her jokes hit for me uh the episode's just kind of a weird concept I mean like a kid-friendly diehard I I guess it's not impossible to pull off, but it's just, it makes me want to see Die Hard more than anything. Um, and Happy Hogan, uh, I don't want to spoil too much, so, you know, if you haven't seen the One of series, um, you know, maybe don't watch this. I, I might have been a bit late to kind of say that now, but, um, yeah, Happy Hogan, this is like where you get all the Twitter clips of him, like, basically turning into, like, this purple Hulk thing. It's just weird because it looks like such an uninspired design. Like it's like a bold, bald. Than well, Thanos is already bald, but like a. It's it's weird. It's just a weird design. Weird episode. I did not like it at all. Um, uh, not the worst though. The worst I would say is episode four. What if Iron Man crashed into the Grandmaster? So the issues that I talked about before with like the quippy writing, just all culminates in this terrible episode like oh my like basically get every bad quippy character and put it into one episode like none of these jokes work the concept i guess is kind of cool like a marvel approach to like death race right but obviously like kid friendly so you don't get like gore or anything like that but uh just so like so bad it, and it's supposed to it's supposed it's like weird because this is supposed to be giving us the background to a character that was only briefly featured in the first season but we don't follow her as the character like Gamora like Gamora from like one of the what if universes in the first series or first season is in this episode and it's supposed to be like her background but we're following like Tony Stark uh and this episode features Korg prominently. I I, th I think I'm just going to go on file right here saying Korg is like my least favorite MCU character. Like it's just, and this episode is like an encapsulation of why it's just bad modern Marvel writing. The action isn't really that great. I, I would say it's just not, not that great, but through to form episode five, like kind of, Somewhat close to the midway point, a little over. What if Captain Carter fought the Hydra Storm Stormers or something like that? Let me see, let me see then. Uh, sorry, it's not loading the full name. The Hydra Stopper. This episode is amazing. I I love it personally. I think I think what works for it and why um you know they they went with it is because i i think the what if writers know that captain carter is like a fan favorite and um yeah i can't deny it. she's like one of my favorite characters from this what if series and like one of the only things that i think like has been tried like they, they've tried to carry over into the mcu to you know like the mcu movies to various like you know ranges of success um but no, this one's good. Uh, a lot of it is Captain Carter. I, you know, I, the actress who I, I'm so sorry that I don't have her name off the top of my head here. Um, uh, granted, I don't know if they brought her like her live action uh, counterpart to do her voice because they like to do that. But obviously for some actors, they're like, nah, I don't want to do that. So they get like good, like decent sound alikes. But um, 
if it is like the original actress, like she does put a lot into this performance, even if she, uh, unfortunately, at least to me, has always had kind of a smaller role in the MCU. Like she had that Agent Carter show, but I think that only had like a season or two before it was like canceled. Uh, but in any case, she like really elevates the performance. You, you get like this really, um, like kind of deeper moment i remember in the episode where she's talking with like her um steve rogers and it's kind of like the the one time this show kind of like slows down in a way to give you like this real nice moment between these characters and you know she has like the most compelling kind of arc in which you know kind of similar to captain america she believes that she lost steve rogers and but nonetheless like remains a hero to you know fight for a better world but in this episode she kind of reunites with like steve rogers but steve rogers is kind of twisted into this um winter soldier uh, like winter soldier equivalent in her universe and so um overall great episode i think this one also like uh, the quippy writing is kept to minimum like the um what's her name black widow has a few quippy lines but it's like not it's like tolerable i don't think it's as bad as like the previous season or the previous episode i don't know if it's because maybe going from one to the other is like such a relief to like take such a break from that type of like writing and you know or whatnot but no i i really like uh episode five uh and true to form episode six what if uh kakori uh i Kahori, Kahori, sorry. What if Kahori reshaped the world? This one is interesting because this is the first time that What If is doing like an entirely new idea that we haven't even seen like in the MCU movies. Like, okay, what if we take this original idea? And uh, I, I personally like, I thought it was really cool how um, you had this Native American tribe uh, doing the dubbing of their own native language for the characters in this episode. Uh, and it's just, I don't know, it's it's a cool setting. It's um, an interesting like concept. The writing, I think, is a lot better <laughs> than some of the other episodes. Um, but no, and this is one of the few episodes, I guess, um, I mean, I'm not sure why, I guess because the level of effort that they put into it that does kind of tie in later to the series because for those of you or it, later into this season in particular uh because this series for those of you who um don't know what they like to do is initially they show it as like individual like like an anthology series where nothing like kind of connects to each other until towards the end where you get this point where like the storylines kind of converge into like the final episode or like the final two episodes um like for example he had like a villain in the last season in the first season um that had his own episode but it then but like the final episode is the heroes from the previous episodes of season one coming together to take him on and so they try to continue that pattern in this one but they don't commit to it as hard i'll i'll get to that when i get to that episode but yeah episode six i thought it was also pretty good uh, episode seven what if hella found the ten rings great episode oh my god it was it's so weird because hella wasn't uh hella from thor ragnarok wasn't necessarily like a favorite character of mine like i thought she was like visually cool and like i think a great villain for that uh movie but i didn't think that you know i, I didn't think that they could do much more with her beyond that but this I mean, by episode seven is kind of uh, like, what if she like landed on, like, what if basically she takes the place of Thor and she was the one sent to Earth. She had to like prove herself in order to like regain her powers and it's following her story through that. Um, but just cool concept. Um, uh, what, what more can I say? Yeah, like, cool concept. I think um, the person... I, I don't know if they brought Kate Blanched. Uh, yeah, was Kate Blanched the one that played Hella? I believe it was. Hella. Um, 
Uh, God, show me the actress. Come on, Google. <laughs> well, I think it's Kate Blanche. Um, actress. Hold on, let me act. Sorry, yes, yes. Yeah, Kate Blanche. And I. Th think they brought her back for this to do the voice if not it's like a very good sound alike um but i think she like okay um so the actress playing hella in this series is given like a few of like the uh, quippy one-liners or whatever that marvel is known for but i feel like she makes it work because she kind of has like this smug like the smugness to how she delivers her lines that it just makes it really enjoyable um yeah, it kind of gives you this episode kind of gives you like a cool way or an interesting way of also exploring like more of the mythos in a way of you know uh the saint chi like the i don't want to say like universe kind of but like the world of like you know saint chi and the ten rings because you know we're following that in this episode but overall like again another amazing episode i think uh, i think a lot of people really like this one because again it follows uh hella and it's just a really fun idea uh episode eight what if the avengers assembled in 1602 an interesting one because from my understanding this is loosely adapting uh I don't know if it was, yeah, I think it was like a comic series or or something uh, like Marvel 1602 where it's, you know, Marvel but set in like England 1602. So like how would the heroes be, you know, interpreted in that timeline? I, granted, I know it's not one to one, but I like this episode because uh, season one of What If tried to do something similar with adapting, loosely adapting, um, marvel zombies but a lot of people didn't really like that like myself included one because they couldn't go as intense as the original comic series was like there was some pretty hardcore moments in that comic and also i think the original marvel zombie series had like uh kind of a crossover with evil dead which obviously they probably both didn't want to do and um uh, the licensing would probably also be like a nightmare for it so you kind of get like this weird zombie apocalypse like I, I can't even remember it fully i just remember they were like on a train or something like this weird zombie apocalypse um story uh i remember scarlet witch becomes like a zombie or something that was like the big like oh shocking moment or something um but yeah, that wasn't nearly as fun as what they do here with adapting like 1602 because you still get like the same vibe of, uh, you know, like, oh, what if Marvel, but in a medieval setting. So you have um, like uh, Ant-Man as like kind of this like, you know, Robin Hood-esque, well, part of this like gang of like the equivalent of like Robin Hood for them um and you but to counter them you also have like this high core ruled by like thor happy hogan is again returns in this one as like his kind of like right hand man and overall um very fun episode this one ties into episode five because uh i, I guess um to explain this end of episode five like uh, captain carter's taken through this wormhole and like is eventually spit out in like the 1602 universe and she has to kind of find a way to uh and for context this 1602 universe is like unstable it's going to be like destroyed because that's just kind of what happens with these universes over time and she's so she's trying to find a way to like save it and that's you know the major arc in this episode and um you know what kind of leads into the uh finale here so we get more captain carter which i always love again favorite character of mine overall really really cool episode playing with like a cool concept and the final episode uh episode nine was uh, strange supreme intervene so this episode is a build-up from uh, episode six which teased the return of strange supreme for the first season you know which uh he was part of the heroes now but um I guess just to kind of keep it brief here, it's revealed that um, 
he's kind of this uh, twist villain that he's doing some evil shenanigans to try and restore his world that he lost in the first season. So uh, he tries to trick Captain Carter into helping him do that by basically picking up Captain Carter and having her try and kidnap Kahori. Uh, but she learns about the plan and they both try and take out, um, just again, like basic footnotes in this, like giving you the basic footnotes, um, you know, but they both, uh, Captain Carter and Kahori team up to take him down. A, a decent ending, I think. I don't think it's as like fun as the, the ending to the first season. Um, only because, uh, well, the, the first season that's ending, like the first season's finale had more of like, uh, I think a better buildup because the first season built from every, all the previous episodes where this one only built up to like two of the previous episodes with, for the most, I mean, it, it, it is a callback to, I think like kind of the whole series with like some minor stuff in the background or whatever but in order to really follow it you only need to see like two episodes from this season uh but still like i think a decent finale it plays with some fun cool ideas uh for like a superhero show like this it's probably you know what you want to i i think the first season like i said had a better ending but you know this one is is fine for what it is um so i think with that kind of in mind uh for my recommendation for season two is kind of similar to season one where i think you can for the most part skip around uh to watch like the really interesting episodes like i don't think you have to watch every episode like maybe at worst you have to get like the wiki notes from some of the people like just read up on the plot summary for you know from wikipedia on the previous episodes but i don't think you need to like watch it in full to really follow it um but the th the thing that i wonder with what if is i i know like people like it fine enough like i think most people it either ranges from they you know really like it because they're marvel fans and they like following you know the extended universe of the mcu to people that just think it's like okay that it wasn't quite what they wanted but um you know it, it satisfied them well enough i kind of fit more in that later camp because i've never been like i mean i like the mcu fine i've been critical of what they've been doing like recently uh although i will admit i think what if and some other projects are kind of represent some of the few good things to come out of post endgame mcu um, but the, the thing that I always wondered, like when they first announced this what if series, I thought it was just going to be a straight anthology, which initially like, you know, you think it is, but then they do kind of this interesting thing where they tie it in together in the end, but I can't help compare it to, so I've talked about this with Ken Spark. I, I had an episode with Ken where I uh, interviewed Ken Sparks and we briefly talked about like the state of the MCU or whatnot. And um, I brought up Star Wars Visions and how I really like Star Wars Visions, uh, which also kind of takes a, a similar approach in which each like installment, each individual like episode from the its series or seasons kind of weird to call this like a season with star wars like visions but like each episode is done from a different animation studio and it's like completely an anthology series like nothing really ties into one another outside of sharing like a larger canon with you know the star with the star wars universe and i i wonder if like what if should have taken the same approach you know, if you kept it this just straight anthology style series, but bring in different animators to tell these different stories from like the MCU, right? And maybe even have it the same style where you could bring in the same voice actors for each kid, like each uh, live action counterpart to voice their, you know, animated, um, uh, their animated characters, um, uh, 
And I mean, granted, I don't know how easy or how difficult that itself would be because, you know, I, I imagine the coordination of having to have these actors, you know, do the dubs for, you know, all these different animations. That, uh, as it is, I don't even know how they manage the Star Wars, uh, the Star Wars Vision series. Like, is it just rolling basis? Like, as you finish your animation, um, you know, how does it play out? Uh, hold on, give me one sec. Okay, sorry. Uh, sorry about that. I had to pick up something uh, real fast. But no, I, I, I wonder, like, maybe, maybe it would have been possible to do the What If series like Star Wars Visions, but um, at the same time, I, I do realize, like, some things would have, I think, been more difficult. And I think for what we have with What If, it is pretty decent. Um, however, I am glad it didn't, like, at least the first season didn't win an Emmy, um, only because it was going against, like, Arcane, and I loved Arcane so much more than this series. Uh, what, what's also weird is, I think, um, I think, like, right after they released the final episode for, uh, season two, they... Um, immediately did a trailer announcing that they're going to do a third season of what if which is kind of surprising to me i thought they would wait a little bit before um you know uh wanting to do that to you know see how well season two did but uh, i guess they were already working on season three I, I i'm not i'm not really sure so, but season three looks like it's going to take like a similar approach to the other ones where it's just kind of these like anthology series, like these little short vignettes for each episode that will probably tie in together at the end of the season or might not, I don't necessarily know, but, um, yeah. So final recommendation, like I said, you could skip around. I think, uh, a lot of these episodes, um, like from season two, I would probably at the very least recommend five and six. Um, well, it basically just watching from five all the way to nine. And yeah, because I don't think you really need any context from like one through four to really understand what happens in the finale. Except the only thing you need to understand is that Happy Hogan has like in some of these universes, he could turn into like a Hulk version of himself. Uh, but I don't think anything else really ties together in the previous episodes. Yeah, I, I wonder if some of these first initial like episodes from the start were just kind of like holdovers from the first season. Like they kind of wanted to enter, like kind of wanted to, well, with maybe the exception of episode three because that one does at least loosely tie into um you know, the later part, which, you know, like, with Happy Hogan. But, like, yeah, like, episode four, I wonder if that was meant to be in the first season, but it got cut for whatever reason, and they figured, like, oh, we'll, you know, um, go come back to it if we get a second season. Um, but, yeah, I guess that's just my final take on it. I, I hope season three uh, doesn't have the same issue where you know starts off kind of bad and then like gets better or well not bad like okay to bad and then gets better you know with like one episode um and then just you know remains decent uh but yeah i think that's going to do it for me if you want to support the show you could do so in a number of different ways uh, if you want to do a monthly support, uh, you know, provide monthly to the show, I have a Patreon account. Uh, you have three different donation tiers uh, with uh, some of the tiers you get, like, unique merch. Uh, but if you want to do just a one-time donation, I have a Ko-Fi account. Ko-Fi also lets you do uh, monthly donations, but again, I would recommend um, the Patreon for that more, only because you do get, like, the um, the merch with, uh, you know, with donating from there as opposed to Ko-Fi. 
Uh, I also, speaking of merch, I do have my own merch store with uh, art by uh, George Isaac of Nocturnal Essence, a uh, frequent, uh, frequent collaborator of the program. Uh, all this you can find linked on my Twitter X account, uh, you know, uh, at the top of my page, I have a link tree that combines all these links together. My Twitter account is at podcasting pasta. Again, that's at podcasting pasta, all one word, P's are lowercase. Uh, thank you so much for joining us or joining us, joining me today. And I hope to catch you all later. Uh, bye.